The title of this video is taken from a particular Karen Way, Assistant Director at the Ohio Department of Public Safety, according to her LinkedIn profile. And this lead person was born in the Columbus, Ohio metropolitan area. Apparently went to Capital University Law School. In addition, the person is the uh, alleged Assistant Director of the Ohio Department of Public Safety, four years. Uh, Assistant Superintendent, Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Director of Enforcement at the Ohio Casino Control Commission. Assistant Director, Ohio Department of Commerce. And Chief of Staff slash Chief Legal Counsel, Auditor of State. Let's go ahead and look at the statement of Karen Way or Huey, or however you say that, Homeland Security Advisor for the State of Ohio, Assistant Director, Ohio Department of Public Safety, United States Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight. Quote, addressing emerging cybersecurity threats to state and local government. End quote. June 17th, 2021. Introduction. Chair Hassan, Ranking Member Hall, and members of the Subcommittee on Emerging Threats and Spending Oversight, my name is Karen Way and I am the Assistant Director of the Ohio Department of Public Safety. I also serve as Homeland Security Advisor to Governor Mike DeWine and am a member of the Executive Committee of the Governor's Homeland Security Advisors Council. We appreciate the opportunity to share Ohio specific concerns and information with you this morning. The topic of today's hearing is of great concern to many, and although I speak with you today from the state of Ohio, I know many of my colleagues across the country would echo these same concerns. And uh, later we're going to get into who those colleagues are. Our goals are to enhance cybersecurity across the United States and educate Ohio's local governments and businesses on the importance of taking cyber precautions. Predictions of cybercrime are estimated to in exceeds 6 trillion USD globally and could grow 15% per year. Now I wonder where she got those numbers. The Wall Street Journal 2020 interview of 2021 interview of FBI Director Christopher Wray, interesting character of that, stated the FBI was investigating about 100 different types of ransomware and compared the current state of cyber attacks with the challenge posed by the September 11th 2001 terrorist attacks. The damage created by cyber attacks are well known. Today I would like to share how we believe we could structure our limited resources to make the most impact in Ohio. Despite the next sentence, it sounds like they actually kind of want to make a quote impact in Ohio. That's not a sinister way to word that. That's sarcasm. <clears throat> Preventing cyber attacks requires dedicated resources, coordinated strategies, and local commitment. Reports of cyber intrusions and hacks are common, and the amount of time and resources necessary to recover from a cyber attack is substantial. Well, perhaps for her, it uh, entirely depends on the level of the cyber attack, so called. It can take months to rebuild systems to eventually make a local government, school system, utility, or business whole again. When successful, our state and local government's critical infrastructure and businesses will have the tools to prevent future cyber attacks. Ohio is investing in making strides in our efforts to strengthen cybersecurity. The Ohio National Guard has brought together more than 30 public, private, military, and educational organizations to form the Ohio Cyber Collaboration Committee, known as OC3. Now, that would be an interesting entity to look into, especially who are the uh, or educational organizations and the private and public involvements. Anyway, the OC3's mission is to provide a collaborative environment to develop a stronger cybersecurity infrastructure and workforce. OC3 has established four subcommittees to help it achieve its primary goal. The Charter and Governance Public Awareness Subcommittee, the Education Workforce Development Subcommittee, 
the Cyber Range Subcommittee and the Cyber Protection and Preparedness Subcommittee. These committees are composed of Ohioans with a wide, wide range of cyber and educational expertise dedicated to making Ohio a leader in how to integrate public slash private partnerships into solving cybersecurity problems. That's public dash private partnerships. Anyway, that's a classic element of your uh, petty dictatorial bureaucrats, and this lady certainly has a good list of titles. Very noble of her. And I can guarantee that those subcommittees are hidden behind a maze network of documents and papers and other arbitrary things so they can hide what they're doing there, which is fairly obvious because their purpose is to, quote, make an impact. Anyway, while I have time to share only highlights, I definitely want to mention OC3's great progress with the Cyber Range Institute which is a virtual training ground and testing site designed to enhance cybersecurity in Ohio. The range was developed for and used by the Ohio National Guard schools from K-12 universities and governments and businesses to train our cybersecurity workforce to conduct research, test emerging technologies, and host cybersecurity exercises and competitions. Ohio designed a mechanism to bring existing cyber talent to the fight by authorizing the Ohio Cyber Reserve. Formulated by the OC3's Cyber Protection and Preparedness Subcommittee and authorized by the Ohio General Assembly in 2019. The Ohio Cyber Reserve consists of a volunteer force of trained cybersecurity civilians with the goal to function as a military reserve. Now isn't that interesting? They are organized in regional teams under the command of the Adjutant General. The Cyber Reserve may be called up by the governor to assist government critical infrastructure businesses and citizens in a variety of cyber needs. Regional teams are being created and trained with future duties to include assessing entities for cybersecurity vulnerabilities and making re recommendations aimed at reducing cyber threats. OC3's Educational and Workforce Development Subcommittee has done substantial work. It was responsible for identifying critical needed skills and developing training and educational paths to provide skilled workers in the field of cybersecurity, this subcommittee was responsible for encouraging further development of cybersecurity in both K-12 through 12 and higher education. Finally, this subcommittee trains users at all levels in good cyber hygiene and best cyber practices. Well, doesn't that all sound perfect and authoritative? What constraints are we and local governments facing? As this subcommittee is aware, States have been receiving Homeland Security grant funding since 9-11. It has allowed us to build fusion centers, harden targets, identify critical in infrastructure, and form relationships across sectors that never worked together before. And there's your globalism there. A great example of this occurred last week in Ohio and highlights one serious situation where the federal government's support to the states, locals, and territories was felt. Ohio's dedicated federal homeland security intelligence officer shared information about two Chinese video surveillance technology companies whose products have been banned for purchase or use by federal government agencies since 2018. Despite the federal ban, dozens of these systems were purchased in Ohio, including some school districts and at least one hospital. In turn, Homeland, Ohio Homeland Security, DHS, well that's OHS, drafted a situational awareness bulletin designed to alert Ohio entities that these companies are likely using their products to provide U.S. customer data to the Chinese government for espionage and surveillance systems. Yeah, well, that's because these people would rather be doing that. <laughs> OHS shared the bulletin using the relationships built with Homeland Security grant funding, including OHS contract and information system, and forwarded to all Ohio intelligence liaisons and Ohio public-private partnership members. Now, those public-private partnerships are juridic. Not human, juridic. Almost immediately, responsive emails and phone calls from concerned representatives from Ohio entities that had purchased these products were being received and addressed. High-level technical mitigation information has been already been shared and CISA personnel or CISA personnel are working on a plan with the affected entities that will include a more detailed risk management solution. Ohio uses Homeland Security funding to support traditional capabilities such as interoperable communications, search and rescue capabilities, 
hazmat and information intelligence sharing. Local entities used Homeland Security funding to build out capabilities to prepare for and respond to critical incidents to sustain a level of preparedness. Now, naturally, they have those critical incidents in, in a vague format. What are those critical incidents, you wonder? Are they the things that they're referring to above, or perhaps they're referring to something else there? That's the point of vagary. You assume one thing when they're actually saying something else. Current funding is also used to support three fusion centers across the state of Ohio. In addition, we use these funds to support local projects across the eight Homeland Security regions. With the inclusion of cyber as a priority, Ohio's local governments are struggling even more to address the traditional preparedness needs while also prior prioritizing cyber projects. As Homeland Security funding has been static or reduced in past cycles, forcing cyber into the Homeland Security grant process reduces already limited funding even further. Now notice that part where she lists out the eight Homeland Security regions. Those, I guarantee you, are part of the plan to turn the uh, United States into regional governments based off of the same type of idea that we found with, uh, with the Empire in Star Wars where the regional governors in Star Wars had direct control over the populace with police teams, basically, or task forces or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, that, there was that part in A New Hope where Grand Moff Tarkin states that uh, to the question of what will happen without the bureaucracy when the Senate, or, or I believe it was the Senate, anyway, when the, the, the original Republic was dissolved by the Emperor, one of the people asked, uh, how would they rule without the bureaucracy? And Grand Moff Tarkin states that the regional governors will have direct authority. And here we are getting this eight homeland security regions. Coincidence, perhaps? Or it's just a coincidence, as in it might coincide. Who knows? Food for thought. Anyway, as the seventh largest state with a population over 11 million, Ohio currently receives 6.7 million in Homeland Security funding. The current carve out for cybersecurity is less than 340,000. I would assert that continued use of a small portion of Homeland Security grant dollars both takes away from the needs of traditional Homeland Security efforts and minimizes the importance of cybersecurity and its impact on state and local governments. We would urge Congress to consider a dedicated grant program that will enhance Ohio's ability to focus on cybersecurity capabilities. Ohio's annual stakeholder preparedness review identifies gaps in cybersecurity, including planning, staffing, equipment, training, and exercising due to sporadic and uneven funding. Ohio's local governments find it challenging to formulate plans that address many of these gaps. Cyber attacks are not limited to our major cities and developing strong prevention, education, and tabletop exercises will take time and resources. In light of the resource constraints already mentioned and the increasing volume of cyber incidents, a dedicated program will help ensure we remain prepared for traditional terrorist events and cyber threats without having to choose between them. Yeah, they would love to have the door left open for them to do basically whatever they want under the guise of, quote, public safety. It allows state and local homeland security efforts to remain focused on terrorism and safety while allocating additional funds to cyber to ensure both state and locals are prepared to respond and mitigate the damages from a cyber attack. Now, I bet you anything those terrorists that she's mentioning there are fathers and regular Americans that don't like having things like critical race theory in the school system. You know, the uh, domestic terrorists and so on and so forth. And of course, people that own firearms, naturally. Dedicated grant funding can be used to develop more robust cyber capabilities at the state level to provide guidance and assistance to local communities that lack the funding and infrastructure to implement cyber programs on their own or who look to the state for leadership guidance and standards. Three main areas identified for dedicated funding. The state would share industry developed standards with its local governments, critical infrastructure and small businesses. The state would also offer assessments of current systems. Now, notice here, she's talking about how the state would mandate all these things, just like a regional governor would in the empire of Star Wars. Pretty weird, right? Anyway, 
Uh, the state would also offer assessments of current systems to improve where gaps are identified and direct local governments to resources. This is especially important for smaller local governments and businesses that do not have resources. In addition, the state would use existing Homeland Security procedures to ensure that any funding source created would receive monitoring to ensure compliance with grant requirements and appropriate infrastructure to manage grant funding. The state would provide education and training to local governments, critical infrastructure and business entities that will include cyber exercises and user training resources and guidance documents. The state would make improvements to existing secure communication platforms that will be used to gather and disseminate important cyber information regarding threats to trusted partners. Notice that trusted partners little tidbit they added there at the end. And I do believe this is the I have no doubt that this was written by a committee or a group of people. Additionally, Ohio recommends that if cyber is a separate funding source, that federal guidance requires a condition of funding that local governments and businesses share indicators of compromise with the state to include offender IP addresses, offender email addresses, the source of infection if known, occurrence timelines, and investigator contact information. Now what they're doing here is they're setting up to eliminate people they don't want off of being online to just target people based off of their IP addresses. Notice that one, right? And um, understanding the scope of the problem will identify better strategies, prevention, and mitigation plans. If adopted, we also strongly recommend that federal protection of the entity's information related to the existence and details of the cyber incident. Governments and businesses alike will be reluctant to share news or details of cyber incidents when the information could be shared publicly. That's another interesting tidbit she added there. Ohio recommends that a dedicated funding source for cybersecurity be set aside or granted in addition to existing Homeland Security grant funds to build and sustain cybersecurity programs and projects over multiple grant years. This will allow Ohio to develop longer term strategies in partnership with their, our CISA cybersecurity advisor and other federal, state, and local partners, ensuring the dollars allocated are a wise investment and produce measurable results. In closing, many states, just like Ohio, recognize the importance of responding to cyber incidents and building a level of preparedness with our local government. Yeah, that's called uh, consolidation of power, or rather, uh, solidification of power. Anyway, our hope is that a dedicated cyber grant program can be created to help state and local governments thoroughly develop robust cyber capabilities to be able to combat the sophisticated efforts of cyber criminals. wonder who those cyber criminals she's talking about are. Perhaps someone like me, who's publishing the information in a way that they don't like. Anyway, with many demands on budget, it is difficult to divert such resources or make an impact with only small amounts of funding scattered across the state. We also highly encourage adding a requirement, and notice there, she did use the word we. Well, actually, she used the word we before also, so it's interesting. Not really her talking here. We also highly encourage adding a requirement of after action reporting so we can all learn from and be better prepared for incidents in the future. We appreciate this subcommittee's commitment to addressing cybersecurity threats to state and local governments and hope to continue working with you to implement some of the strategies recommended in the testimony presented today. On behalf of the state of Ohio, thank you for the invitation to testify. So let's move on to the those more local issues that she was referring to. In a case in the United States District, Southern District of Ohio, Eastern Division. United States District Court, Southern District of Ohio, Eastern Division. There we go. This is case number 220CV4812. One, two. Smigelski v. Cluley decided December 4th, 2020. Andrew Smigelski, plaintiff, v. Greg Cluley et al. defendants. Magistrate Judge Kimberly A. Jolson. Judge Sarah D. Morrison, report and recommendation and order. Plaintiff Andrew Smigelski, who is proceeding pro se, that means for self, brings this action against Logan Police Detective Greg Cluley. Former Logan Police Officer Josh Mowry, Logan Police Captain Ryan Gabriel, Logan Police Detective Ben Skinner, Logan Patrol Supervisor Michael Walton, Logan Police Chief Jerry Mellinger, Logan Police Dispatcher Lacey Levering, Logan City Law Director Abigail Saving, Hawking County Judge Jonah Saving, Logan Mayor Greg Fraunfelter, 
City of Logan, Ohio, Hocking County Sheriff's Deputy Caleb Moritz, Hocking County Sheriff Lonnie North, Hocking Sheriff's Department, Hocking County Southeast Ohio Regional Jail as an entity as well as the guards individually, unknown agents for the Athens FBI, unknown agents for the Cincinnati FBI, the FBI, and Ken and Jessica James. This matter is before the undersigned for consideration of plaintiff's motion for leave to proceed in forma pauperis. And the initial screen of plaintiff's complaint under 28 U.S.C. 1915. Plaintiff's request to proceed in forma pauperis is granted. All judicial officers who render services in this action shall do so as if the costs had been prepaid. It's a real interesting way to say that. Furthermore, having performed an initial screen, it is recommended that plaintiff be permitted to proceed with his claim against defendants unnamed South, South, Southeastern Ohio Regional Jail, S-E-O-R-J, guards for their alleged unconstitutional collection of his data, DNA. Defendant clearly for his alleged misrepresentations in obtaining a search warrant, and defendants Maury Skinner and Gabriel for their alleged excessive force against plaintiff because plaintiff's complaint does not specify a prayer for relief plaintiff is ordered to amend his complaint to include the specific relief requested from each defendant within 21 days of the date of this report and recommendation it is further recommended that plaintiff's remaining claims be dismissed background the ohio court of appeals summarized the facts and procedural history of plaintiff's criminal case Plaintiff became involved in a dispute with his neighbors, the James family, that resulted in him being arrested and charged with inducing panic, menacing, resisting arrest, and obstructing official business. The menacing charge arose from his dispute with the James family. The additional charges arose when the police, when police, arrested plaintiff at his house on the menacing charge. Shortly after his, his arrest, the state dismissed the inducing panic charge and amended the menacing charge to aggravated menacing. The state also served a warrant on plaintiff to search his home. Plaintiff filed a motion to suppress evidence alleging that the search warrant was invalid on its face. When the state conceded at the suppression hearing, however, even though the court granted plaintiff's motion to suppress, it does not appear that the ruling had any practical effect regarding plaintiff's case because none of the charges pending at the time, aggravated menacing, obstructing official business, and resisting arrest, were dismissed after the motion was granted. Plaintiff waived his right to a jury trial and a bench trial ensued. Now notice that last part. You do not have a right to a jury trial. A trial by jury, as listed in the Constitution, shall take place in all criminal procedures. So that's kind of interesting. It's not something you can waive. You shall have it, right? Anyway. Uh, Ohio v. Smigelski, number 19CA6, 2019, WL5797340. At the trial, the prosecution moved to dismiss the charges for resisting arrest and obstructing official business. Plaintiff was convicted of menacing a fourth-degree misdemeanor and sentenced to a fine of two years of probation. At... Uh, that's, uh, scratched out or whatever. Redacted. Plaintiff unsuccessfully appealed, alleging ineffective assistance of trial counsel. That's an interesting one there. Prosecutorial misconduct. That's not a surprise. And more broadly, that his conviction was against the manifest weight of the evidence. It does not appear that plaintiff appealed to the Ohio Supreme Court. That's interesting, because this is uh, the federal court. Generally speaking, plaintiff alleges that state and local officials violated his 1st, 2nd, 4th, 6th, 8th, and 14th Amendment rights, and federal officials violated his 1st and 4th Amendment rights. Plaintiff's complaint elaborates on the events leading to his arrest. According to plaintiff, he got into a brief oral disagreement with his neighbors, Ken and Jessica James, regarding a noise complaint he made against them. His neighbors then went to their friend, a Logan, Ohio police officer, defendant Josh Mowry, about the incident. Defendant Mowry is a, alleged known for his misconduct in the police department. Defendant Mowry allegedly asked one of the department's dispatchers, Defendant Lacey Levering, to call the jail to make sure there was a bed available. 
On September 12, 2018, that doesn't sound like corruption. <laughs> Defendant Mowry allegedly went to plaintiff's house and peered into his window with his gun drawn and then called for the special reaction team, which allegedly shortly arrived shortly thereafter, which uh, arrived shortly thereafter. Defendant Caleb Moritz, Sheriff's Deputy for Hawking County, instructed plaintiff to complete a voluntary statement form. Defendant Moritz allegedly indicated his intent to enter plaintiff's house and recover plaintiff's firearm. And there you find the purpose for this whole thing. It always has to do with the firearm, right? They always go straight for the firearm. They know what they're doing. Anyway, plaintiff, however, did not give him permission to do so. Yeah, no surprise. Plaintiff alleges that defendant Moritz then told him that he was not under arrest and would not be attacked. That's kind of weird. Would not be attacked. Wow. Weird wording. Defendant Mowry, however, allegedly grabbed plaintiff by the collar, whipped him to his knees, then grabbed the back of the plaintiff's neck and slams, slammed plaintiff's head into the concrete. According to plaintiff, defendant Mowry then handcuffed plaintiff tightly enough to cause bruising. Defendant Ben Skinner, a detective for the Logan Police Department, who was also at the scene, allegedly piled onto plaintiff and tasered him. Defendant Ryan Gabriel, captain of the Logan Police Department, along with several other officers, allegedly brutally restrained plaintiff. Defendant Mowry then drove plaintiff to, plaintiff to SEORJ. Plaintiff alleges that although Defendant Mowry did not read him his Miranda rights, the Miranda rights are, are by the way, not. I, I don't believe they're constitutional. Anyway, he nevertheless requested an attorney and invoked his right to remain silent. Plaintiff was strip searched upon his arrival at SEORJ. SEORJ guards also collected his DNA. Yeah. Wonder why that was. Wouldn't have anything to do with treating people like cattle, would it? Or possibly future actions that they wish to take against those that own guns first, naturally. Anyway, defendant Greg Cluley, one of the detectives present at plaintiff's arrest, later searched plaintiff's house. To obtain the search warrant, defendant Cluley allegedly made a number of false accusations. For example, plaintiff says that although body cameras show otherwise, defendant Cluley falsely accused him of handling a gun when the defendant Mallory first arrived at plaintiff's house. Defendant Cluley also allegedly falsely claimed that the police seized a knife from plaintiff during his arrest and says plaintiff defendant Cluley repeated these false statements to the Logan Daily News. The warrant authorized the search of plaintiff's residence for firearms, ammunitions, firearms, accessories, cell phones, computers, and writing pertaining to his thought process and any contraband. Well, one thing I can tell you for sure is that that warrant was likely, well, I suppose I can't say for sure, but it's likely that that warrant was not authorized by a jury, which according to the Constitution, all warrants shall issue from a jury, basically. And of course, uh, both of affirmation and probable cause. Specifically highlighting the places and items to be seized. That's not a specific at all, mind you. Anyway, it also permitted a forensic examination of plaintiff's cell phone. Plaintiff alleges that defendant clearly viewed and copied plaintiff's internet phone, internet, phone and location history, as well as naked photos, text messages, and applications data. The government did not bring charges pursuant to the search results, and at December 18, 2018 hearing, Logan City Prosecutor Defendant Abigail Saving agreed to the dismissal of the search warrant. Still, plaintiff alleged, alleges she repeatedly referred to evidence as trial that had not been produced and made false statements at both plaintiff's arraignment and trial. Plaintiff notes that the defendant, Abigail Saving, is married to defendant judge Jonah Saving who granted defendant Abigail Savings' request for bail and issued the search warrant before recusing himself from the case. Plaintiff brought this action on September 14, 2020 for numerous alleged constitutional violations stemming from September 12, 2018 arrest and subsequent proceedings. Standard. Because plaintiff is proceeding in form of pauperis, the court must dismiss the complaint or any portion of it that is frivolous, malicious, fails to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, or seeks monetary relief from a defendant who is immune from such relief. 
So that interesting. They're already setting up to throw this thing out. <laughs> no surprise there anyway. 28 U.S.C. 1915 Rule, the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, requires a complaint to set forth a short and plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. In reviewing his complaint, the court must construe it in favor of plaintiff, accept all well-pleaded factual allegations as true, and evaluate whether it contains enough facts to state a claim to relief that is plausible on its face. A claim has facial plausibility when the plaintiff pleads factual content that allows the court to draw the reasonable inference that the defendant is liable for the misconduct alleged. These are what you call legalese when they try to figure out really ridiculous ways and bend over backwards to circumnavigate the, well, whatever's going on here because nothing has cited our, uh, constitutional articles other than the plaintiff's complaint or uh, well, it's not really a complaint, but charges, basically. They, they, they frame it as a complaint, but these are really charges. He is actually charging these people himself, and that is constitutional. In addition, he's the only one who has actually cited constitutional clauses. Nobody else here has cited constitutional clauses, and mind you, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Not U.S. codes or Ohio Revised Code or any of that stuff. Or regulations or case law or any of that that's all supposed to be canon and help to reinforce what is there in the Constitution it is not supposed to be superior or supreme to the Constitution like they're doing here anyway on the other hand a complaint that consists of labels and conclusions or a formulaic recitation of the elements of a cause of action is insufficient Although pro se complaints are to be construed liberally, Haynes v. Kerner, the rest of these are citing court cases and other case law nonsense. Basic pleading essentials are still required. Wells v. Brown. Discussion. Of plaintiff's numerous claims, only a handful survive. Apart from those, as explained below, plaintiff's claim complaint suffers from several fatal flaws, both in form and in substance. The undersigned addresses them below. Private parties. The plaintiff's claim against his neighbors, Ken and Jessica James, must be dismissed as they are not cognizable under 42 U.S.C. 1983. To state a cause of action under Section 1983, a plaintiff must allege, one, deprivation of a right secured by the Constitution or law of the United States caused by a person acting under the color of state law. That's not what it says. They are misquoting here, mind you. These are your officers of the court, alleged, misquoting the federal code. The traditional definition of acting under the color of law requires that the defendant in a 1983 action have exercised power possessed by virtue of state law and made possible only because the wrongdoer is clothed while the authority of state law, with the authority of state law. West v. Adkins, quoting U.S. v. Classic. Therefore, as a general rule, 1983, U.S. Code, does not reach the conduct of private parties acting in their individual capacities. Although there are exceptions to this rule, plaintiff does not raise any of them, and because defendants Ken and Jessica James are private parties, plaintiff has failed to state a claim against them. Personal involvement. Relatedly, to state claim for the relief under Section 1983, plaintiff must allege that each defendant had personal involvement in the deprivation of his rights. Grinter v. Knight. Importantly, Section 1983 does not permit respondent superior liability. Rather, a supervisor must be held liable only where he encouraged the specific incident of misconduct or in some other way directly participated in it. Again, case law. Plaintiff fails to allege personal involvement or of supervisor, supervisor li liability as to seven defendants. This is what's called, in fact, here in this document, acting under the color of law. These people are pretending to have authority and jurisdiction when in fact they have none because nobody is following the jury or any of the other constitutional clauses, mind you. Anyway, to begin, plaintiff does not provide sufficient factual content or context from which he undersigned 
would, from which the undersigned could infer that defendant Moritz was personally involved in any alleged unconstitutional conduct. Plaintiff alleges that the defendant Moritz told plaintiff he would enter his house and encouraged the Logan Police Department to make an to conduct an illegal search of his home. It's not an illegal search, it's an unlawful search. Well, I suppose they're virtually the same thing in the context of the Constitution, but it should say conduct an unconstitutional search of his home. That would be more accurate. Anyway, but plaintiff does not allege officers searched his house at the time. Rather, he alleges his house was later searched pursuant to a faulty warrant. Accordingly, plaintiff has failed to state a claim against defendant Moritz. Defendant Mellinger. Next, plaintiff alleges that defendant Mellinger, Logan's chief of police, failed to intervene both when defendant Mowry arrested him and when defendant Cluley allegedly made false statements to obtain a search warrant. Although not entirely clear, of course that search warrant wouldn't be constitutional, it appears plaintiff seeks to hold defendant Mellinger responsible based on his supervisory position, but as noted, a supervisory official cannot be held liable under section 1983 unless the plaintiff can demonstrate that the supervisor encouraged the specific incident of misconduct or in some other way directly participated in it. Isn't that fun with their little wording games there? Yeah, because this judge is certainly not involved in these collusive schemes. Anyway, specifically a plaintiff must allege that the supervisor official at least implicitly authorized, approved, or knowingly acquiesced in the unconstitutional conduct of the offending officers. In other words, supervisor liability under uh, USC 1983 cannot be based on a mere failure to act, but must be based upon active unconstitutional behavior. Plaintiff's allegations against defendant Mellinger fail to satisfy this standard. He does not allege facts suggesting defendant Mellinger implicitly authorized, approved, or knowingly acquiesced in the alleged unconstitutional conduct. Instead, he alleges only that the defendant Mellinger failed to intervene Section 1983, however, does not permit claims based on a failure to act. Thus, plaintiff's claim against defendant Mellinger cannot survive. Defendants levering and unnamed FBI agents, plaintiff also fails to allege factual content or context from which the undersigned could infer that defendant Lacey Levering, a dispatcher for the Logan Police Department, was personally involved in any alleged constitu constitutional violation. Plaintiff alleges only that the defendant Mallory asked defendant Levering to call the jail to see if there were beds available, and she complied. Even construing plaintiff's allegations liberally, the undersigned cannot draw an inference of unconstitutional conduct on the part of defendant Levering. Plaintiff's claim against her must be dismissed. The same is true regarding plaintiff's claims against the unnamed FBI agents. Plaintiff alleges that the unnamed FBI agents received information from de defendant Cluley and surveilled and investigated plaintiff until the search warrant was dismissed. But plaintiff does not set forth facts showing, for example, that the agents knew the warrant was based on a purportedly perjured information. Thus, plaintiff fails to provide sufficient factual content or context from which the undersigned could infer the agents were involved in an alleged unconstitutional conduct. Plaintiff's claims against the unnamed FBI agents agents must therefore be dismissed. Defendants North Sheriff's Defendants North Sheriff's Department, Hawking County. Finally, plaintiff fails to allege specific facts as to defendants Lonnie North, Hawking County Sheriff's Department, or Hawking County to the extent plaintiff seeks to hold these defendants liable under a theory of respondent respondiat superior. As explained, section 1983 prohibits him from doing so. Accordingly, plaintiff's claims against these defendants must be dismissed. Immunity. Additionally, several defendants are immune from liability. I love that. They're immune from liability in a in any sense of corporate nonsense. But they are not immune from liability of the Constitution, and they are certainly not immune from practical liabilities. Take of that what you will. Anyway. Taking the factual allegations in the complaint as true, plaintiff's claims against defendant judge saving are barred by judicial immunity. Judicial immunity shields judges and other public officers. There, this, this is such garbage because in the Constitution, it states that all judicial officers have to swear an oath to the Constitution. And this specific part right here is in direct violation of the Constitution. This is just a joke. It's just a joke, you know? Anyway, 
from undue interference with their duties and from potential disabling threats of liability. Like other forms of official immunity, judicial immunity is an immunity from suit, not just from ultimate assessment. Judicial immunity is overcome only by the actions taken were not in the judge's judicial capacity and if the actions taken were in absence of all jurisdiction. Plaintiff alleges that defendant Judge Saving signed off on defendant Cluley's search warrant that was almost entirely perjured, failed to question the obviously deficient search warrant, and signed off on a search warrant for a case that he knew or should have known his wife would be prosecuting. But these allegations do not lead to an inference that defendant Judge Saving was acting outside of his judicial capacity when he issued the warrant. Those are called bench warrants and they're unconstitutional, mind you, for a very specific reason. And this is showing one of those, few of those specific reasons, actually. Holding the municipal judge was immune from plaintiff's allegations that the, she conspired to and violated his civil rights when she signed a search warrant authorizing the search of his residence. The same is true regarding plaintiff's allegations that defendant Judge Savey knew or should have known that his wife was involved in the case. Again, there are no facts in the complaint from which the court could infer that defendant Judge Savey acted in the absence of all jurisdiction. To the extent plaintiff may be alleging bias on the part of defendants that affected the fairness of their rulings and proceeding, proceedings, plaintiff's allegations of bias or misconduct do not render the actions of defendants non-judicial. In sum, that would mean the summary. Ugh. I, I really don't like these people, especially in their writing. It just comes out their contempt for the general human public. Even construing the complaint in the light most favorable to plaintiff, his claims against defendant Judge Saban are barred by judicial immunity and must be dismissed. Prosecutorial immunity, relatedly. Plaintiff's claims against defendant Abigail Saving are barred by prosecutorial immunity. Prosecutors are absolutely immune from liability for their actions that are all intimately associated with the judicial phase of the criminal process. Absolute immunity, however, may not apply when a prosecutor is not acting as an officer of the court, but is instead engaged in other tasks, say investigative or administrative. The analytical key to prosecutorial immunity is whether the action in question are those of an advocate, whether the prosecutor is in a proper motive, acts in bad faith, or even acts in an unquestionably illegal manner is irrelevant. Like that one. Plaintiff's allegations against defendant Abigail Saving, including, for example, that she lied at his arraignment and refused to comply with discovery, fall within the scope of prosecutorial immunity. Noting that prosecutorial immunity applies to actions intimately associated with the ju judicial phase of the criminal process. The same is true regarding his allegations pertaining to the criminal investigation as they concern defendant Abigail Saving's offers made during the pretrial negotiations. Noting that examples of investigation or administrative actions include giving advice to police officers or making press conference statements or making a statement in an application for a warrant. In short, there are no factual allegations in the complaint from which the court could draw the reasonable in inference that defendant Abigail Saving acted as anything other than advocate for the state. And blah blah blah. Plaintiff's claims against her are therefore barred by prosecutorial immunity and must be dismissed. Sovereign immunity. Plaintiff's claim, claims against the FBI also cannot proceed. In Bivens v. Six Unknown Agents, the Supreme Court held that a plaintiff could recover damages from federal agents for injuries inflicted in violation of the individual's Fourth Amendment rights, 403 U.S. at 338-389-1971. Such claims are the counterpart to suits under 42 U.S.C. 1983 against state officials who infringe plaintiff's federal constitution or statutory rights. Because the FBI is a federal agency, plaintiff's claims against it cannot proceed. Political subdivision immunity. Finally, plaintiff alleges that several individual defendants, as well as the city of Logan, the city, negligently retained defendant Mowry. More specifically, he alleges that the city failed to fire defendant Mowry after he publicly posted his white supremacist beliefs, and the city's policies and procedures should have prevented these violations, or that those policies and procedures were the direct and proximate cause of these violations. Well, that that part, well, that part speaks for itself. 
Similarly, plaintiff alleges that the captain of Logan's Police Department, Ryan Gabriel, along with Logan Police Detective Ben Skinner, Logan Parole Supervisor Michael Walton, and the city's mayor Greg Fraunfelter, knew defendant Mallory was a white supremacist and negligently allowed him to remain on the police force. Plaintiffs notes that he is an LGBT individual and defendant Mallory is a neo-Nazi. Oh god. Well, there's your primary reason why I know most people wouldn't take this seriously, I suppose. Anyway, Ohio law, however, offers a broad grant of immunity to political subdivisions and their employees for civil damages, actions rising from an alleged act or omission of the political subdivision or an employee of the political subdivision in connection with a government or proprietary function. There are certain exemptions to this broad grant of immunity, as specifically described in whatever that is, uh, U.S. Code 2744.02b and 2744.03a6. However, plaintiff does not raise any of them. Notably, this statutory immunity applies to only claims for damages, and plaintiff does not state a specific prayer for relief in his complaint to the extent he is seeking monetary relief from these defendants. Those claims are dismissed to the extent he is seeking injunctive relief. He may amend his complaint accordingly within 21 days of the date of the order. Any such amendment must specify with particularity the precise injunctive relief requested as to each of these defendants. Now, mind you, that little tidbit in there about the so-called white supremacist, whatever the hell that means, uh, that, again, none of that has to do with Constitution. And none of those are grounds for abusing someone, even if, like myself, uh, a person might disagree with those sentiments, statements, or otherwise nonsensical labels that have been put through propaganda campaigns and other things like that. Anyway, the Constitution remains the supreme law of the land, and nobody here is actually following them, other than, surprisingly, the plaintiff. Anyway, plaintiff let well, to an extent, he's still sort of recognizing things that are not legitimate. Anyway, plaintiff alleges that defendant Mallory failed to advise him of his Miranda rights or provide him an attorney after he requested one. But because a ruling on these claims would call into question his continuing confinement of two years probation, these claims are barred for the Heck Doctrine. See Heck v. Humphrey. And because the exemption to that doctrine that the reason for his confinement has been reversed on direct appeal, expunged by executive order, declared invalid by a state tribunal, or called into question by federal courts, issuance of a writ of habeas corpus do not apply. Plaintiff's claims may not proceed. That's an interesting one by about habeas corpus, by the way, because that is specific to a part of the Constitution that state that states that only in times of I believe it's like grave emergency or something like that, that the habeas corpus can be suspended, which is uh, complaining about being unfairly uh, treated by a judicial system. But considering all these judicial systems that we have aren't, aren't real, they're not constitutional, they don't follow the constitution at all, they're acting under the color of law and therefore none of these courts are legitimate. Anyway, plaintiffs allege that SEORJ guards unconstantly strip-searched him, SEORJ employees connect, collected his DNA despite having been arrested for a misdemeanor and not a felony, and defendant clearly made his false statements to obtain a search warrant the undersigned addresses each claim in turn. strip search. Plaintiff names SEORJ as an entity as well as the guards individually, but does not specify whether he is suing the guards in their official or personal capacity. In any event, plaintiff alleges that he was placed in a holding cell and strip searched. He alleges that the strip search further invaded his privacy to even more extreme levels. The Supreme Court, he has held that detainees may be subject to suspicionless strip searches as part of the jail's intake process. Boy, that's very unconstitutional. I mean, most of these things they're doing are very unconstitutional, so I suppose it's, you know, go big or go home, right? In other words, as a general matter, strip searches of pretrial detainees are constitutionally permissible. No, they are not. They're not constitutionally permissible. That's a lie. But anyway, it's referencing a Johns v. Oakland, as always, case law apparently is superior to the Supreme Law. Anyway, Jails may not, however, conduct a strip search in any way, shape, or form, including, for example, 
and in intentional and other abusive practices. But plaintiff does not allege particular facts surrounding the strip search. Internal quotation marks and citations omitted. Here Johns alleges that only that on, not only that she was strip searched, but that she was strip searched in an abusive manner while female officers performed the search. They did so in front of male guards and with John's clothing being ripped from her body. Accordingly, plaintiff's general allegation that he was strip searched upon booking fails as a matter of law. Yeah, what a crock. DNA collection. Plaintiff also alleges that SEORJ, through its employees, collected his DNA even through Ohio law mandates DNA collection from only felony arrestees, requiring a head of law enforcement agency sheriff of police to collect DNA from adult felony arrestees. To the extent plaintiff is seeking to hold SEORJ employees liable in their official capacities, plaintiff would need to allege facts showing that SEORJ had a policy or custom that resulted in the unconstitutional conduct. But there are no facts suggesting that SEORJ had a policy or custom that permitted its employees to collect DNA from non-felony arrestees. Accordingly, plaintiff fails to state a claim for relief against SEORJ or its guards in their official capacity. To the extent plaintiff is seeking to hold SEORJ unnamed guards liable in their personal capacities, he claims his claim may proceed. Plaintiff alleges that the individual unnamed guards at SEORJ collected his DNA even though he was not charged with a felony offense. Because plaintiff alleges that he was charged with misdemeanor and not a serious crime, his claim survives the initial screen. Search warrant. Plaintiff alleges that defendant clearly made a deliberate falsehoods in his affidavit in support of a search warrant, including the officers removed a knife from the plaintiff's person during his arrest, despite other officers telling defendant clearly that he did not possess a weapon. The underside notes that the state conceded that the warrant was deficient at the suppressing, suppression hearing. Any officer who obtains a search warrant by making materially false statements in the affidavit on which the warrant is based may be held liable, where the officer made the false statements knowingly and intentionally or with a reckless disregard for the truth and setting aside the false statements. The remainder of the affidavit is insufficient to establish probable cause. To the extent plaintiff seeks to hold defendant clearly liable in his official capacity, plaintiffs have failed to show that the Logan Police Department had a customer policy resulting in plaintiffs alleged constitutional deprivation. Regarding defendant Cluley's personal liability, while the facts of the case may show otherwise, plaintiff has pled enough to state a plausible illegal search claim against him. Dismissing illegal search claim where complaint failed to identify any false statements contained as the application for the search warrant. Excessive force. Plaintiff alleges that Deputy Mowry attacked him during his arrest, grabbing him by the collar, whipping him to his knees, slamming his head into the concrete, and leaving bruises on his abdomen. Plaintiff also alleges that the defendant Mowry handcuffed him so tightly that his wrist had lost circulation and bruised. Plaintiff further alleges that defendant Mowry used force even though plaintiff physically complied with his arrest. Additionally, plaintiff alleges that after defendant Mowry used excessive force, defendant def Detective Skinner piled onto him and tasered him, and defendant Captain Gabriel, along with other officers, pushed his way through to brutally restrain plaintiff. It is axiomatic that individuals have a constitutional right not to be subject to excessive force during an arrest. Brent v. Callendine. However, the amount of force used to accomplish this arrest is objectively reasonable based on Fourth Amendment seizure principles, then no constitutional violation occurred. Uh, that's a load of crock. <laughs> well, it's a load of crap and it's a crock. Anyway, to the extent plaintiff seeks to hold these officers liable in their official capacities, plaintiff has failed to allege facts showing that the Logan Police Department had a customer policy resulting in plaintiff's constitutional deprivation. Well, he's going wrong, obviously, because he's even bothering with this court in the first place. But anyway, but plaintiff's allegations on their face state a plausible excessive force claim against them in their personal capacities. Plaintiff may proceed with these claims as a result. Conclusion. Plaintiff's request to proceed in form of Pop Harris is granted, and based upon the foregoing, it is recommended that plaintiff be permitted to proceed with his claims against defendants' unnamed SEORJ guards for their alleged unconstitutional collection of his DNA. Defendant clearly for his alleged misrepresentations in obtaining a search warrant, defendants Mowry, Skinner, and Gabriel for their alleged excessive force against plaintiff because plaintiff's complaint does not specify damages or injunctive relief, plaintiff is ordered to amend his complaint to include specific relief requested from each defendant.
within 21 days of the date of this report and recommendation. It is further recommended that plaintiff's remaining claims be dismissed. Finally, it is recommended that the court certify pursuant 28 U.S.C. 1915 that for the foregoing reasons an appeal of an order adopting this report and recommendation would not be taken in good faith and consequently leave for plaintiff to appeal in form of pauperis is denied. Finally, procedure on objections to report and recommendation. If any party objects to this report and recommendation, that party may, within 14 days of this date of this report, file and serve on all parties within objections to these specific proposed findings or recommendations to which objection is made. Together with supporting authority for the objections, a judge of this court shall make a de novo examination determination of those por portions of the report or specified proposed findings or recommendations to which objection is made. Upon proper objections, a judge of this court may accept, reject, or modify in whole or in part the findings or recommendations which herein may receive further evidence or may recommit this matter to the magistrate judge with instructions. Now, interestingly, they love to quote things in Latin without explaining what the Latin means. Pretty big twats there. Anyway, the parties are specifically advised that failure to object to the report and recommendation will result in waiver of the right to have district judge review the report and recommendation de novo, and which means of new, basically, and operates a wait as a waiver of the right to appeal the decision of the district court adopting the report and recommendations. It is so ordered, date December 4th, 2020, Kimberly A. Jolson, United States Magistrate Judge. In continuation with this local outfit, let's go to the City of Logan Police Department 2022 Annual Report and others. There are two parts specifically that are important here. Under 2022 Significant Events, it states, Maintained Certification through the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board. Now we'll take a look at them in a minute. But next we have another interesting part where it talks about policing for our community. Created in 2017, Policing for Our Community is a department authorized Facebook page and community outreach program initiated by Midnight Shift personnel. The program allows the Midnight Shift to post timely crime watch information, safety tips, and explanations of various city ordinances to keep the public informed and educated concerning local police matters. Now, I know for many today, these city ordinances are becoming particularly aggravating. The program has also donated thousands of dollars worth of toys, bicycles, gift cards, and other goods to members of the community while out conducting patrol duties. Now, here's an interesting part in that phrase. It states the program has donated. How does a program donate things? Or more importantly, how does a program own things? It's interesting. I guarantee you this program is a juridic entity with filing paperwork and all of the accompanying things that go along with it, including immunities and special privileges in these fraudulent court systems that parade around under the color of law as, quote, judicial officers of the Constitution. Anyway, this program has become hugely popular in the community, garnering nearly 10,000 followers. Yeah, I doubt that somehow. Drug Take Back Initiative. In 2019, the police department teamed up with Major Crimes Unit for the nationwide annual Drug Take Back Day in April. And that talks about prescription drugs, which I guarantee are resold on the black market or something like that with the CIA and all that stuff. And then we have the School Resource Officer Program initiated in early 2000. This is the first major community relations program initiated by the Logan Police Department, and it is still the most popular and well-known community program in the department. The SRO program has involved, evolved from simply having a patrol officer based at the school for public safety, quote unquote, to a comprehensive program involving elementary, middle school, and high school students throughout the school district. The SRO's conduct conduct educational programs at the schools that include drug and alcohol prevention, cyberbullying awareness, safe driving, and general health and wellness education to students in the community. 
that last part, that's one to look at. That health and wellness, that has to go directly with cardinal principles and is a prime reason why we're in this position that we are today. Anyway, the SROs serve as mentors, counselors, and advocates for at-risk students in the schools. They provide positive role models for many kids who lack any structure or positive influence in their home. Now, of course, that positive is entirely dependent on the perspective because and then we've got the really creepy Officer Phil. The Officer Phil Safety Program teaches children about stranger danger, the negative effects of bullying, fire safety, and internet safety through fun interactive lesson plans. With the idea of bringing child safety lessons to elementary schools, these programs are continued throughout the year by school resource officers. That doesn't sound like indoctrination. <laughs> 2022 goals revisited. Notice this one right here. Conduct a needs assessment and design study for a new public safety facility. Now, how much do you want to bet that that is a detention facility that is part of the plan to lock up anyone with firearms and any other people and essentially create their dream of the quote unquote new world order for the globalists? Highly suspicious, especially considering the other things that we saw previously in this video with a certain Karen. Speaking of that Karen, Let's go ahead and look at the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board. The smoking gun, if you will, of this entire saga. And this is from August 19, 2019, meeting summary. Now, it states the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board Collaborative is a multidisciplinary group consisting of a diverse group of Ohioans, including law enforcement, community members, elected officials, academia, and faith-based community. Yeah, we call that conspiracy and corruption. The Collaborative was created by Executive Order 2015-04K on April 29, 2015, after the Governor's Task Force on Community Police Relations compelled its work and produced a report with recommendations on how to improve the important relationship between law enforcement and the communities they serve. Those would be the Dritic communities, naturally, not the human ones. They uh, bully, harass, and oppress the human ones. And do so, of course, with the help of certain groups like BLM and Antifa, which they pretend to be the antithesis to. As we will look at the names on this list, the collaborative is chaired by Assistant Director Karen Huang, Department of Public Safety. Members appointed by the governor, including ex officio members, are identified below. Commissioner Lori Barreras, Chari, I believe would be chair, of the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. Representative Juanita Brent, Ohio House. Dr. Ronnie Dunn, Cleveland State University, Associate Professor of Urban Studies and Interim Chief and Diversity and Inclusion Officer. Now, how much do you want to bet that that person is directly a component, a organizing component of BLM and Antifa, who allegedly go around putting a cab on things? Which, if you don't know what that means, you probably haven't been paying attention in the last, since in the last few years. So that guy is determining the protocols and procedures that your local police departments will be following. And I guarantee there are setups and organizations exactly like this across every part of the United States and in other countries. Because these people are like carbon copies of each other. They, they always have these form these committees and these ad hoc courts and they just basically do whatever they want. They just um, pretend like they're following the law, but they really just thumb their nose at it because practically speaking, they succeeded bullying, at least up to this point. Anyway, Dr. Robin S. Engel, University of Cincinnati Professor of Criminal Justice and Director of IACP slash UC Center of Police Research and Policy. Officer Anthony L. Johnson, Columbus Police Department and member Frater Fraternal Order of Police. That Fraternal Order of Police is yet another one of those unelected government entities that secretly control all of the things that police do. Anyway, Sheriff Tom Miller, a Medina County Sheriff's Office 
and member of the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association. BCI Superintendent Joe Morbitzer, Ohio Attorney General's Office. The Reverend Walter S. Moss, Pastor and CIRV Project Director, Stark County Prosecutor's Office. Makes you wonder what a reverend is doing in a prosecutor's office. Anyway, Chief Michael J. Navarre, Oregon, that's probably Oregon, Ohio, Police Department, a member of the Ohio Association of Chiefs of Police, Honorable Ronald J. O'Brien, Franklin County Prosecutor. Yeah, I, it's more like dishonorable Ronald J. O'Brien. Senator Sandra Williams, Ohio Senate, Representative Phil Plumer, Ohio House, the Honorable Tom Roberts, former Ohio Senator and President, Ohio Conference of Units of NAACP, the late Honorable Louis Stokes, former member of Congress, and late Honorable George, George V. Voinovich, former U.S. Senator, Governor of Ohio, Mayor of Cleveland, and a real piece of crap. The purpose of the collaboration is to advise and work with the Office of Criminal Justice Services, OCJS, in the Ohio Department of Public Safety to implement the task force recommendations as identified in the executive order. August 19, 2019, Columbus, Ohio, meeting of the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board. The collaborative meeting was held on August 19, 2019 at the Ohio Department of Public Safety. That's no surprise, that's their, their stronghold and currently the Logan police are trying to build one there specifically. That's not interesting. That's sarcasm. The meeting began at 10.08 a.m. The following members were present at the meeting. Assistant Director Karen Hue, OCIS Executive Director Carlton Moore, Representative Juanita Brent, Dr. Robin Engel, Officer Anthony L. Johnson, Sheriff Tom Miller, Reverend Walter S. Moss, Chief Michael Navarre, the Honorable, well, more like Dishonorable Ronald J. O'Brien. Assistant Director Hue opened the meeting by providing an overview of the agenda focusing on the development of a pursuit policy standard. Now let's get into that. <laughs> Executive Director Carlton Moore thanked everyone for attending the meeting and introduced the first speaker, Jeff Furby, Columbus Police Department Legal Advisor. Jeff Furby, Assistant City Attorney, Columbus PD Legal Counsel. See PowerPoint. Ohio requires a pursuit policy, but thus does not dictate what is in it. The police pursuit policy is one of the most frequently reviewed police policies. What needs to be considered in developing a pursuit policy? How to identify a pursuit to capture desired conduct? Notice the wording of that line. How to define a pursuit to capture desired conduct? And in continuation, for what does an officer pursue? In what manner? Speed, length of time, jurisdiction. How are pursuits documented, controlled, managed, terminated? How are they reviewed, evaluated, investigated, disciplined after the fact? In Ohio, the law sets legal boundaries but does not define best practices. Well, that's not true because we do have a thing like the Ohio Constitution. And then above that is the supreme law of the land, the U.S. Constitution. However, here they state only that the relevant ORCs apply, specifically 4511.03, 4511.24, 2744.02, Officers are immune to the traffic code and speed when pursuing. Isn't that nice? They're immune to everything else, apparently. Pursuit case law, well, I mean, they are foreign operatives, right? They are... Uh, the Gestapo going in to kick down doors and uh, kill people and take their stuff, basically. Kill people and break things. So, it wouldn't be any surprise that they would, quote, be immune from things. Anyway, what to take from the law relative to the formation of a pursuit policy must comply with ORC, due regard for safety of others as to speed, intersections, audible sound signals, Willful slash wanton slash reckless misconduct. Now that, in there, that is basically absolving themselves of any liability. They love to do that a lot. A lot of stuff has to do with absolving oneself of liability. Sort of like the priests in the certain Catholic sects, anyway, because there are many. They wouldn't want you to know that. There are many types of Catholics, but either way, the the more controlled version has this thing called 
absolution of sins, which is the exact idea of absolving of liability. Anyway, Jennifer Knight, acting Deputy Chief Columbus PD, pursued policy as the most evolving policy they have, having been revised 10 times in 20 years. The most recent version took place February 28, 2019. It's available online at this thing. Every year, they generate a report based on all pursuit incidents, which includes an evaluation of pursuit data for trends. Sounds like tracking. CPD has also very restrictive pursuit policy, and as a result, they have roughly 25 to 45 pursuits a year. Most pursuits last three to five minutes, probably because they can shut down the vehicles that people drive today with the click of a button. Pursuits are dangerous for officers and the public, and can be costly in terms of vehicle costs. That would be the Dritic public they're talking about, by the way, not the human public. They don't give a crap about any of us. Anyway, incidents have become more high profile, particularly with the increase in video camera usage. Well, I shouldn't say they don't give a crap about us. They, they treat us exactly like we are. Ignorant enemies. We are, to them, enemies, but many of us are ignorant. And so, as long as they don't do things too obviously and upset too many people, they can basically get away with what they, they're doing. At least until now. It is important to develop policy that can be understood and applied in rapidly evolving and stressful situations. Steps in developing policy. Begin by defining what constitutes a pursuit. What will govern the officer's decision to engage in a pursuit, engage versus continue pursuit? This must be asked continually throughout a pursuit. Changes in pursuit policy occur in response to high visibility incidents, public pressure, and officer behavior. CPD policy has our, was articulated things to consider. Decision on when to engage, when to terminate, role of supervision, what vehicles are authorized to pursue, how to respond to requests for assistance by other agencies, how pursuits should document and investigate it, how officers should be trained, stopping tactics must align with policy, with policies governing use of stopping tactics. Not the Constitution, of course, but has to align with policies, like a corporate company policy, for instance. Factors driving policy. Responding to improvements and changes in technology, especially video, critical and high-profile incidents, changes in trends in officer and suspect behavior during pursuit responses. Policy does not matter. Broad and flexible considers the differences between agencies and the areas being policed must be supported by training. A 2018 pursuit review report now available, which evaluates all incidents, identifies trends, and provides recommendations. Uh, Q&A. Clarification was sought regarding pursuits across jurisdictions and liability issues. See, they're always concerned with liability. They're not concerned with whether or not something's right or constitution or anything. It's always just about liability and how they can get away with what they're doing. What about issues of liability? Courts will look at a violation of policy as one factor in determining willful slash wanton behavior. However, a violation of policy does not necessarily mean the courts will hold the department liable because CPD has such a restrictive policy. Do all departments have pursuit policy, may not have robust policies. Training and conducting pursuits is very important, but can be very costly to do real world scenarios. Can training be shared among departments? It can, but large agencies often pay a premium for such training and often do not even have enough room for their own officers, let, let along, that should be let alone, officers from another agency. And here they're showing all of this collusion between themselves about how they operate like a military force, working together to uh, rob and suppress and ultimately kill the the people that they pretend to uh, well, you know, you know what they pretend to do anyway. How involved is collective bargaining specific to CPD? They are not involved in any negotiations with regard to this kind of policy as it would be a horrible precedent to set. CPD assesses and revises the policy as they see fit based on the data that they collect. They do notify the FOP about policy changes for informational purposes. What are examples where officer behavior influences policy change PIT maneuvers? IACP has a model policy center and their pursuit policy is currently under review. They are not going to put out a model policy, but rather a consideration document and corresponding research paper. What do you see as a baseline for all agencies? Important that each agency identify what works best for them. IACP is kicking the can for very good reason. It's hard to identify a single policy that will work across all agencies, urban, rural, large, slash, small, etc. The resources available to an agency is another big factor to consider. Important to evaluate the cost benefit of a pursuit, light sirens, and due regard are the minimum. Legal standard is the baseline. Not constitutionality, of course, the quote, supreme law of the land. Must be a list of offenses identifying what can be pursued. 
Major Swindle? <laughs> That's a name. OSHP Commander of the Office of Field Operations. That's the Ohio State Highway Patrol. OAS, OSHP, uh, let's call them Road Pirates. A lot of people like that term. Has 59 patrol posts, both urban and rural. Different environments to consider, so the policy has to be very broad. Pursuit policy is the number one policy that gets reviewed. Their pursuit policy generally falls in line with that of CPD. Multiple factors to consider when deciding whether to initiate pursuit, such as the seriousness of an offense, number of occupants, traffic volume, etc. Primary pursuing, officer responsibility, provide info to dispatcher and supervisor, speed, description of vehicle and suspect, reason for pursuit, intention, continued termination tactics, backup unit will assume radio communications and allow primary officer to focus on driving, only two units will be directly involved, and no caravanning will take place unless advised by supervisor. Those are some interesting specifications of their tactics there. <laughs> That's important to keep in tactical mindset. Supervisor responsibility. Direct and control pursuit through effective communication. Supervisor not required to be physically present. Once supervisor terminates a pursuit, the pursuing officer will immediately deactivate lights and sirens and return to normal patrol operations. Pursuits with other agencies. Officers shall evaluate their participation based on the provisions of OSHP policy, they will try to determine the reason for the pursuit and a supervisor will be notified immediately. Crossing state boundaries will not cross unless the nature of the felony is such that it would result in risk of death or serious injury to the public. Supervisor must approve. That would be the juridic public. Let's, let's play this game of let's not list how, that there are two types of public. That's that's their game. Many intervention techniques were described. Training is needed for some of these techniques as they can be dangerous to implement. And of course, injury to a juridic public would be different as injury to a human public. Same thing with death. OSHP risk management reviews the pursuit policy at least yearly and review the previous year's incidents to identify trends. Troopers and dispatchers are trained and tested annually, and roll call refreshing training is conducted every two years. Pursuit incidents are reviewed by management and then sent to district for further review. RTR committee will review incidents that result in death or serious injury. I like how we have a committee reviewing that. Ugh, what a crock. Anyway, annual assessment. 12, uh, one, 1,207 pursuits and or response to resistance. 826 vehicles of pursuits. 189 pursuits were terminated by supervisor or trooper. Pursuits make up a very small number of OSHP incidents, less than a half of 1%. In 2018, OSHP had 1.5 million incidents in a total of 1,207 pursuits. Q&A, do you conduct traffic offense pursuits? Yes. Do you have supervisors calling off pursuits even if it falls within the policy, sometimes mostly for minor violations? OSHP has to deal Frequently, with crossing jurisdictions, will often terminate because it is hard to know that quickly what the details of the pursuit are. What do you consider baseline needed for a policy supervision? Someone has to be engaged in making decisions. This is obviously an issue for smaller agencies, but in larger agencies, supervisor involvement should be possible. Training real life scenario training is important. Who is talking with whom during a cross jurisdictional pursuit? Often, one dispatcher is talking with another dispatcher. If information on the pursuit is not readily available, the supervisor will terminate. Members discussed regional communication centers and dedicated pursuit channels. How do stats on pursuits and terminations compare to that of other agencies? Unsure, but OSHP does a seven-year rolling comparison. OSHP does not have a goal. They use the data to look at trends and determine policy changes. Well, that's a lie. Well, I suppose OSHP doesn't have a goal, but these people have a goal. The people that control the Ohio State Highway Patrol and all other so-called law enforcement agencies, well, the controllers, they have the goal. Anyway, Executive Director Moore thanked the presenter, presenters and discussed next steps. It is the hope that by the next meeting we can have something we can all agree on, agree to with regard to a standard, and that the standard will be in place by the end of the year. Everyone should look at the draft as a starting point and make suggestions for changes. If there is anyone else we should hear from before making a decision on the pursuit standard, let OCJS know. The next meeting will likely be scheduled in October, and it will be done via doodle poll. 
The draft can be provided to others for feedback. BSSA and OACP have received a draft. Keep in mind we are writing standard, not a policy. Yeah, isn't that nice? They're writing a standard, not a policy. That's got a lot of implications in that sentence. We can reach out to rural jurisdictions for their pursuit policies and perspectives on pursuits. C-A-L-E-A -E standards should also be sent out. Next standard for consideration will focus on officer wellness. We may also consider a youth standard. In the Constitution of the United States, which is specified as the supreme law of the land, it states, quote, treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on confession in open court. The Congress shall have the power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainder of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. In Article 4, or is that 6? I think it's Article 6. Or is it 4? No, I'm pretty sure it's 4. Uh, 6 and 4, I'm a little bit annoying on the Roman numerals. All debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. Oh, that's not. Um, the, this Constitution and the laws of the United States shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. Supreme law. Not case law. Not codes. None of that. The Supreme Law is the Constitution, but it has to be enforced. That's the important part. It has to be enforced against all of these people that we just mentioned here and what the evidence shows, the evidence shows their activity and what they're doing. But the Constitution has to be enforced against them. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Judges shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, not with standing. Anything that contradicts the Constitution has no standing, basically. Senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, all, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution but no religious test shall ever be required as qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Now, I can pretty much guarantee you that those professors that are dictating standards to all of our so-called law enforcement agencies, I can guarantee you, I would bet a lot, that they have not sworn any oaths to the Constitution to occupy that position that they self-appointed themselves to with the help of all of their other cronies and conspirators. Next, in Section 2, the judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under this Constitution. The laws of the United States and treaties made of which or which shall be made under their authority to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, to controversies with the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between a state and citizens of another state, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming land under grants or different states, and between a state or the citizens thereof and a foreign state citizens or subjects. In all cases affecting ambassadors, well, don't need to go into that one. The bottom part is the important the trial of all crimes. Gotta, we got to like notice these words there. It states all. Not some, not a few, not whichever you want it to be, but the trial of all crimes shall be by jury. It does not state that you can waive that. It doesn't state it's a constitutionally protected right. It states that all crimes shall be by jury. Not by a judge, by a jury. These people are not only traitors if they are U.S. citizens. And if they're not U.S. citizens, then they're enemy combatants. 
They are in direct violation. They're flying in the, they know what the constitution says and they are doing what they're doing anyway. That is called mens rea or state of mind. It's willful conduct. And such trials shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed. But when not committed with any state, within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. And of course, is the legitimate Congress. Haven't had one of those in a while. Next, under the Sixth Amendment. Okay, I think the other one was the fourth. This is the sixth. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall, notice it does not say if it please you, your highness, it states shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed. It's an impartial jury. It is not a judge, it's a jury. Which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Not representation, assistance of counsel. The Fifth Amendment. No person shall be held to answer for a capital crime or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury. Again, not a judge. Except in case, uh, cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger. Nor shall any person be subject to the same offense or to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. In, in the examples that we previously showed, it, people were deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. The people instigating that, regardless of their reasons or anything else, they didn't follow due process, they didn't acquire anything from juries, they didn't do anything the Constitution stipulates, they are directly violating the Fifth Amendment. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. Under the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, which we've already seen, shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly the describing the place to be searched and persons or things to be seized. Very specific there. We are certainly not secure in our houses, papers, persons and effects against unreasonable search and seizures. Absolutely none of us because these people in their little clubs where they get together behind closed doors and doors and determine how the quote standards and policies are going to be they don't care about any of these clauses that they act in the name of they are acting under the color of law so let's go ahead and look at a u.s code which is subordinate to the constitution and not superior but again the constitution has to be enforced practically and physically in 18 U.S.C. United States Code 2020 edition, Title 18, Crimes and Criminal Procedure, Part 1 Crimes, Chapter 13, Civil Rights, Section 241, Conspiracy Against Rights, it has a definition for what conspiracy is. If two or more persons conspire to injure, oppress, threaten, or intimidate any person in any state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district, in the free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege, secured to him by the Constitution or laws of the United States or because of his having so exercised the same. That's where they get you. In this quote, it states the right or privilege. The clauses in the United States Constitutions are neither rights nor privileges. They're charges. They're directives. They're mandates. They're telling you what will happen regardless of whether you want it to be or not. And that's where they get you. It's not a constitutionally protected right, and it's not a constitutionally protected privilege because it's a constitutional mandate. Very different things. 
If two or more persons go in disguise on the highway or on the premises of another with intent to prevent or hinder his free exercise or enjoyment of any right or privilege so secured, again, we, there we go with the trickery in the words, they shall be fined under this title of prison not more than 10 years or both. And the nice part about that is at the end it states can be given death penalty. Definitely uh, not enough of those going around today. Then we have entitled, uh, AT, again, same part, but section 242, deprivation of rights under color of law. Whoever under color of any law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom willfully subjects any person, state, territory, commonwealth, possession, or district to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution or laws of the United States. Now, let's look at this wording for, for a minute. Immunities secured or protected by the Constitution. That's in addition to rights and privileges. There aren't any immunity. Well, there are some immunities, but there are no privileges and rights that are secured by the Constitution. Like I said before, they're mandates. And so when you recognize the legitimacy of these fraudulent codes, you are placing them above the Constitution because these codes are acting in the color of law themselves. They are violating the Constitution because they are referring to rights and privileges. That would be the Bill of Rights. But those wouldn't be constitutional amendments. Those are mandates and charges. They're not rights and they're not privileges. But there are immunities that are secured in the Constitution. Usually for ambassadors and things like that. Anyway, pains or penalties on account of such person being an alien or by reason of his cut, blah, blah, blah. But either way, these codes are what most people follow. And what's defined in these codes are taking place to some extent but they play word games. Dereliction of duty. Dereliction of duty is a specific offense under United States Code Title 10, Section 892, 892, Article 92, and applies to all branches of the U.S. military. Now, dereliction of duty does not only apply to U.S. Code, mind you. See, this Wikipedia article is putting U.S. Code as the ultimate and supreme law, which it's not. The Constitution is. But dereliction of duty is a specific concept and is also addressed in many other places, including the Uniform Code of Military Justice, to which every service member is bound, as well as the Constitution. And we'll get to that in a minute. A service member who is derelict has willfully refused to perform his or his duties or has incapacitated himself in such a way that he cannot perform his duties. And here's the important reason why we look at this. Allegiance. Your allegiance is your support for and loyalty to a particular group, person, or belief. Notice those words. Support for and loyalty to. And allegiance is a duty of fidelity said to be owed or freely committed by the people, subjects, or citizens of their state or sovereign. These definitions are screwing around with the word because allegiance is a thing that binds you such as the thing that you state in a in a, a marriage where you state that until death do us part right but there's some allegiances where not even death can free you from it that is the oath of enlistment which would be better described as the oath of allegiance it states, I, state your name, do solemnly swear or affirm, again, that clause in the Constitution about affirmation and all that, even though that has to do with a warrant, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. These people are domestic and, in many cases, foreign enemies that we just looked at. They have demonstrated as much, and their willful conduct can be derived from the evidence. Don't even have to get them to admit it, because they have penned their name to the documents. It's the proverbial smoking gun. Anyway, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. This is better described as the oath of allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. Not the flag, not the nation, 
not law enforcement officers, not codes, not regulations, not statutes, none of that. Not even the commander of chief, not officers appointed of you, above, above you. You are swearing allegiance to the Constitution, to the words in the document. It doesn't matter that this states that and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. That part doesn't mean anything because you swore in this allegiance to the Constitution, to the document, to the words in that document. And all the veterans and all the people that have sworn this oath and are failing to uphold the Constitution against the so-called law enforcement and all of the other people that parade around in the name of it while they're directly violating every statute and every single article and every amendment and all the clauses and all the words they are directly violating them and there is a boatload of evidence every single veteran and every person in the military that has taken the oath of allegiance is in dereliction of duty Thank you. If you have enjoyed this content, please like it, share it, subscribe to my channel, and check out all my other content that I have published. There are free books available at the link. And if you so desire, you may support my work at PayPal or Cash App.